Okay, guys, we are going to start class today by you uh, performing a chi-square practice problem. This is what you were taught yesterday. You have a homework assignment that's due by 11.59 tomorrow night. Now, I'm going to give you about seven to ten minutes to do this, but ultimately the goal is for you to be able to do this in less than five. As you get better at it, you develop that muscle memory and how to do these. So if you are watching at home, you can do this on your own or you can fast forward to where I go over it. Well, I'm going to give all of you about seven minutes or so to put this together. Now, it's a little cheat sheet. If you look up on the whiteboard, I have a step-by-step -step procedure that you should follow on how to accomplish this. I know that if you're at home, you can't see it, but I will spell it out for you when I go over it. So I'm going to be quiet now. Give you guys an opportunity to do these on your own, and we'll, we, we will reconvene in a few minutes. Good luck. Add those calculators out and do these on your own, folks.
So the volume is just for the alpha would be is that which one do we do the alpha for? Do we do for all four? You have to do all four, the summation of all four. <laughs> It's going to be on the AP bio. If you guys are thirsty, I have two cases of water up front. Help yourself. A few more minutes. Another minute. Okay, the PowerPoint's been up for 10 minutes. Let's go ahead and begin.
to oops. All right, Let me just open up a new page. All right, here we go. In trouble, watch and learn. So let's go by step one. Up on the, on the board, step one says, calculate the phenotype frequencies. So to find the frequencies, you first need to identify what is the genotypes of the parents that you are crossing. We are having a heterozygote, heter, a double heterozygote is what they call it, cross with a heterozygote homozygous recessive. Now this problem kind of contradicts what I've told you about. Don't use letters where the capital and lowercase look the same. So I'll definitely try to be sure that you can tell the difference when my capital Y is lowercase Y is capital S is lowercase S. Now, in this class, I want you guys to work smarter, not harder. So rather than do a big dihybrid cross, do two monohybrid crosses. We need to determine the frequencies. So we'll have one uh, monohybrid cross for height, and we'll have the other monohybrid cross for color. So according to these um, outcomes, 75% are going to be tall, 25% are going to be short. 50% are going to be green, 50% are going to be yellow. So then you need to multiply those two frequencies by each, by, um, or to each other so that you can figure out the uh, actual percentage or frequency of each of the four outcomes. So first outcome, we will have tall and green. That would be 0.75 times 0.25. That equals 0.375. We have tall and yellow. 0.75 times 0.25 is going to be, or excuse me, why am I doing 25? You're probably sitting there like, huh? I meant to put 0.5, excuse me. Uh, 0.75 times 0.5 is going to be 0.375. Short in yellow is going to be 0.25 times 0.5, and that will equal 0.125. And then we have short in green. That will be 0.25 times 0 0.50, which is 0.125. These are your frequencies, which is what you need to do first. Are there any questions there? Now, step two on the whiteboard says calculate the phenotypic quantities. So if you looked on the original PowerPoint slide, it told you you had 52 tall, uh, tall and green, 55 tall and yellow, 26 short and green, 27 short and yellow, for a total of 160. You need to have that total. So the total is 160. So you're going to multiply these predicted frequencies by 160. 0.375 times 160 is 60. 0.125 times 160 is 20. So these are going to be your expected quantities. That is what I have you doing for step two. Any questions yet? No? All right, so then you're going to do the whole chi-squared setup. Chi-squared equals the summation of all the observed minus expected outcomes. So we need to set this up. We have, we have four outcomes. So we need to set up four tables. So it's observed minus expected squared over expected. So observed for tall and green was 52 minus the expected 60 over the expected 60. 52 minus 60 squared over 60. For tall and yellow, 55 minus 60 squared over 60. Short and green, 26 minus 20 squared over 20. 
And then shorting yellow, 27 minus 20 squared over 20. That is your setup before I've done any math on part three. Any questions there? So then you just have to take a moment and do your math. And I'm going to show my work so all of you can see what I'm doing. 52 minus 60 is going to be negative 8 squared over 60. Uh, 55 minus 60 is going to be negative 5 squared over 60. 26 minus 20 is going to be 6 squared over 20. And 27 minus 20 squared is going to be 7 squared over 20. Negative 8 squared is 64 over 60. Negative 5 squared is 25 over 60. 6 squared is 36 over 20. And 7 squared is 49 over 20. Then I'm going to need my calculator for this one. 64 divided by 60 is 1.07. I would recommend that you go to the 100s place. 25 divided by 60 is going to be 0.42. 36 divided by 20 is going to be 1.8. And 49 divided by 20, oops, 49 divided by 20 is going to be 2.45. You then add those up because that's what chi-square calls for. It calls for the summation. So 2.45 plus 1.07 plus 0.42 plus 1.8. Chi-squared value is going to be 5.74. That is your chi-squared. Any questions on how I got that? So then you need to go back to your uh, PowerPoint slide. Let me switch screens here. And I need us to determine how many degrees of freedom are there. There are four different possibilities. Tall green, tall yellow, short green, short yellow. So how many degrees of freedom would that be? Three, you always, t you always subtract one. So if we have four possible outcomes, that means we have three degrees of freedom. And under the 0 0.5 column of certainty, our critical value is gonna be 7.81. So the critical value is 7.81. Eight, one. According to, uh, that was step four, you compare chi-squared to the critical value. Now, step five, we accept or reject. The null hypothesis simply means that there is no anomaly, uh, no problem with your setup. Everything is, a, uh, everything is copacetic. Your outcomes are statistically uh, acceptable. That happens if chi-squared is less than the critical value. Chi-squared is less than the critical value here. So we would accept the null hypothesis. There's nothing wrong with the experiment. There's nothing wrong with this, uh, with this setup. The outcomes are statistically likely and accepted. Any questions? Yes. Now, um, yes, go ahead. So, you guys have homework that is going to be due on Wednesday by midnight, 11.59 technically. There are seven problems. Be sure you do them honestly. This is to get you um, familiarized with this material so that you know how to do it on your own. A lot of you are getting your driver's licenses. I would prefer to take my driver's license after getting practice in driving, not just showing up cold and not even knowing how to turn on a car. You need to make sure you get this practice. Trust the process. All right, with that being said, we're going to switch gears. We're going to go into the topic for today and tomorrow. And this is going to be sex linked traits. Now, in most mammals, males have the XY pair of, of sex chromosomes. And females 
have the x x pair. Let's see what you guys remember from just a few weeks ago. What do you call that actual visual representation of chromosomes from an individual? Very good, a karyotype. So if you actually looked at a karyotype, here's what a female would look like. Those are two X chromosomes. Looks like a rabbit. And then here is a male. So when you actually look at the X chromosome, it can carry up to 1,100 genes. That's a lot. The X chromosome is actually pretty big. The Y chromosome, however, not so much. That can carry up to mm, 78 genes. Not a lot. There's basically just genes that help in the formation of sperm. And what is that big time gene that really helps a fetus develop as a male? Jasmine? It's called the SRY gene. So that is something that's pretty important. It does have the SRY gene. We talked about how sometimes the SRY gene can jump ship and leave the Y chromosome and go with the X. That's Dale Chappelle syndrome. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 uh, actually kind of new. It it showed up about about 300 million years ago, and 300 million years ago there weren't even reptiles. All there were was fish, amphibians, and maybe some reptiles. So reptiles are really the first species to actually have sex chromosomes because typically. Um, some amphibians could have their gender determined not by sex chromosomes, but by the temperature that the eggs are incubated. And fish can actually change, a lot of fish can actually change their gender just based on the environment. Um, I don't know if I told this to this class, but if you really want to ruin Finding Nemo for someone, you tell them that in clownfish, the only thing that actually keeps a male as a male is the presence of a female. And so at the beginning of Finding Nemo where Marlin's wife gets killed by the barracuda, Marlon would have automatically turned into Marlene. And when Nemo hatched, that would have been Nemo, the male, and the two of them would have been a pair. Isn't Disney magical? Also, Simba and Nala had the same father, Mufasa. That was Nala's dad too. Can you feel the love tonight? All right. So, um, what, something I want to definitely go over with you guys because it, it seems um, obvious, but you never take anything for granted. Um, no matter what, what sex chromosome do we inherit from our mothers? The mother passes on the X chromosome. How many does she pass on to her offspring? How many? One, how many does she have? So what is that Mendelian law where a parent has a full set of genetics, but the parent passes on just half of what she, she or he has? The law of segregation. So here's how this looks. I'm really trying to help you guys bring up some stuff in the past. What do we call those somatic cells that are destined to be sperm cells or egg cells? They are body cells, but they have a purpose to, be, to go through meiosis to become haploid cells, which will be your gametes. Do you know what Sage? Germline cells. They're called germline cells. So this is a diploid cell. You can see that it is XX. What, what happens to cells DNA in the S phase of the cell cycle? Come on guys, what happens? It replicates. So technically for a very brief period of time, how many X chromosomes are there in a cell? There'll be four. And then you go through meiosis. We'll go through meiosis one. That's uh, one cell becomes two.
meiosis. And then we go through meiosis two, where two cells divide into four. And these are all gonna be egg cells. So as you can see, 100% of a female's egg cells have an X chromosome. So no matter what, we inherit the X chromosome from our mama. But then we have the guys. Guys can be complicated. However, when it comes to males, the male either passes on a copy of an X or a Y to his offspring. Your father determines your gender. If you inherited your father's X chromosome, you're gonna be his daughter. If you inherited your father's Y chromosome, you are going to be his son. Yes, Jet. Yeah. It's always 50 50, right? Yep. So here is your father's germline cell, XY. Every cell in your body has your sex chromosomes. If I took a cell from your nose, girls, it would have an XX, and guys, it would have an XY. Every cell in your body has a sex chromosome. So during the S phase, tell me once again what happens to the DNA in a, during the S phase. It replicates itself. So temporarily, a guy has two X's and two Y's. That is going to go through meiosis one. And then we're going to divide it again. Meiosis two. These are going to be little sperm cells, X, Y, X, Y. So 50% of a male's sperm has an X chromosome and 50% has a Y. I think I told you this many times. I'm going to say it maybe one more time. Very first episode of Family Guy, Stewie had a flashback when he was a sperm cell going to try to fertilize Lois's egg, and he's shooting down other sperm cells like this um, Star Wars scene. And in one sperm cell he shot down with his little sperm cell laser guns was carrying a girl. That sperm cell from, what's, what's the guy's name? The father? Peter? I can't believe I just had to ask that. Um, that one must be carrying his X chromosome because I was going to be a baby girl. But Stewie obviously is a baby boy. He was carrying the Y chromosome, and he shot down that one girl that was in front of him, and he got to fertilize the egg cell. So males, all of you right now, 50% of your sperm carry an X, 50% of your sperm carry a Y. Your father determines your gender. It can be broken down as um, basically with a Punnett square. Fifty-fifty. Now, how many of you are one of two children or one of several children, but everybody is the same gender? Anyone? Anyone? What are you? Uh, three, all girls. three girls. Okay. So in order for you to have all girls, what was the chances of the first child to be a daughter? 50. 50. And the second child? 50. 50 and the third child. 50. Okay. So 0.5 times 0.5 times 0.5. You can't just say, the chances of us having three girls was 50-50. No, it wasn't. It's 50 times 50 times 50. So 0.5 times 0.5 times 0.5, there was a 12.5% chance of having all girls. It would be a 12.5% chance of any combination, but just that girl, 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 you have to do 0 0.5 times 0 0.5 times 0 0.5 each time. Not just saying we have three girls. It was a 50-50 chance. It was, no, it's... You got 50% of 50% of 50. So what is 50% of 50? 25. And then what's 50% of 25? 12 and a half. That's the 0 0.125. Okay. So are there any questions with any of this?
I have one more thing to show you, then we're going to get into the actual pioneer that realized this whole idea of sex linked traits. Let's just pretend for a second that humans could inherit a disease called werewolfism. If you inherit the recessive form of the trait and you have two copies of the recessive form, you are going to turn into a werewolf during the full moon. So let's get the alleles figured out. If you have this allele, this means that you are wild type. This generally means normal. You're not going to be a werewolf. But if you have this genotype or this allele, this is going to be the werewolf gene. And we will call that the mutant gene, by the way. So I should actually flip that around. We're going to call this the mutant. And this is going to be known as werewolf syndrome. And what if I told you that this is a sex linked trait? So let's have a woman. And let's have a man. The woman, guys, is homozygous dominant. She does not have a trace of the werewolf gene in her genetics. So her, both of her X chromosomes are considered normal. But the man does turn into a werewolf at the full moon. I want you to notice something. If this trait is linked to the X chromosome, how many copies can a female have? How many copies can a male have? One, because males only have one X chromosome. Females, you all have two. So here's my big question. This man and this woman have two sons. Will their sons inherit the werewolf gene from their father? Why not? If they're going to be sons, that means they're going to be boys. And what chromosome do boys inherit from their father? The Y. Is the Y chromosome the one with the werewolf gene on it? Uh-uh. And if you look at the mother, both of her X chromosomes are the same. So they are going to inherit the wild type gene from their mother. These boys are going to be totally unaffected. So what I wanted to show you in this is that boys do not inherit X linked traits from their fathers because they don't inherit an X chromosome from their father. They inherit it from their mother. Yes, Ayla. So would the mutant gene be like genetically out of their Yes, it's gone. Unless this couple decides to have a daughter. And what would the daughter definitely be? She would be a carrier for werewolf syndrome. And then maybe she might pass it on to her son. So this stuff can last generations. All right, here we go. Let's get into it. Let's talk about a Mr. Thomas... Uh, Tom, hold on, totally just had the biggest brain fart of my day. Yeah, Thomas Hunt Morgan. I don't know why I thought it was Thomas Morgan Hunt. A little dyslexia right there. Thomas Hunt Morgan. So we don't often think of Thomas Hunt Morgan when it comes to genetics, but he was a huge contributor to it. We think of Gregor Mendel. But there were other people besides Mendel that worked with genetics. He wasn't the only guy in the face of the earth to actually work with um, the idea of humans and other creatures passing on their genes from one generation to another. But Gregor Mendel used pea plants for his experiments. Thomas Hunt Morgan used fruit flies for his genetic experiments. The name of the fruit fly is called Drosophila 
Melanogaster. This is the scientific name. Just like our scientific name is Homo sapien. And there's a reason why I wrote it in italics. That's just the basic rule when you write the binomial nomenclature of an organism. You have to have the, that's the genus name and the species name. The genus is always a capital letter at the front. Everything else is lowercase and it has to be in italics. If you write Homo sapien, you have to write slanted. Capital H, Homo, everything else, sapien, italics. Now, why did he choose the fly? Well, they can reproduce very quickly. If any of you decide to go into some sort of science or medicine when you go to college, you'll probably need to take a genetics class. I took genetics, and I can tell you that in my lab, the first lab, you go to lab once a week. We got some male and female fruit flies, like four of them, and we put them together in a vial, so they're gonna start reproducing. And I can tell you in a week, they already had eggs. And in two weeks, they were already adults. So in two weeks, they went from not even being conceived to being adults. It happens very fast. And also, here's something else really cool. They have the same sex chromosomes as humans, XX and XY. So you can study uh, characteristics that might be passed on um, on X chromosomes. Hold on, Ryan. So when it comes to fruit flies, they only have four pairs of chromosomes. What do you call the chromosomes that make up your bodily structures that are not unique to your gender? Those are called autosomes. So they have three pairs of autosomes. And they have one sex pair. Yes, Ryan. There's some, you know, X and Y are some types. Uh, a platypus has seven sex chromosomes. Um, chickens, for example, males are ZZ and females are ZW. So birds, mammals, insects, reptiles, it's all different. But lo and behold, this little bug, this fruit fly has the same sex chromosomes as we do. Now, in his experiments, here's what he focused on. He studied by he and me, Thomas Hunt Morgan, the eye color of the flies. Now here's why that's a big deal. In flies, you have the wild type color. Wild type means the most common, it typically means the dominant form. The wild type, is going to be red. The mutant type is white. And so if you have this allele, this means wild type. You're gonna have normal eyes. And in the case of flies, that would be red. If you had this allele, this would be mutant, and that would be white. And so Thomas Hunt Morgan had all these fruit flies. He made hundreds and hundreds of fruit flies. And so what he did is he had a red-eyed female crossed with a red-eyed male. And this would be the P generation, the original generation, the OG, literally, original generation. What do you call the offspring of the P generation? You remember? F1, familial one. And he found, based on his undeniable observations, that there's a three to one ratio for every three red, or I should say three wild type, there was one white or mutant. And he had hundreds of these. Here's the thing he noticed. This is different than uh, Gregor Mendel's pea plants. He noticed that every single white-eyed fly was male.
so that led him to realize that this trait of eye color was not on an autosome, like height or wing shape or color. It was on the sex chromosomes. And here's what he did. Here's what he noticed. The females were carriers for white eyes. Here's the female's genotypes. You see that? That female is heterozygous. But is her phenotype a wild type or mutant type? She's wild type. So she, when you look at her, she's got red eyes. He crossed that with a male that clearly had red eyes. Now, I'm not going to tell you what we call that genotype yet. It is not homozygous. It is not heterozygous. Because when you say homo, you have to, that means two, like the same. Well, if you look at the female, we can see, okay, 1X, 2X. That's the same. But um, W positive and then W, that is not the same. So the opposite of homo is hetero. But if you look at the male, there's nothing to compare it to. There's not a pair. So I'm going to tell you in a second what we call that. And when he had the offspring, here's the Punnett square. And I want you guys to see this. Oops. There's the female. Here's the male. What percent of the females will be wild type? Let's look. 100%. What percent of the males will be wild type? 50%. So what parent are these males inheriting an excellent trait from? The mom. And so this led to his realization of something called a sex linked trait. We'll have to stop there. We'll pick this up on the next day. I allotted two days for this lesson, so we're about halfway there.